This is a presentation of the University of Wisconsin Parkside. And when I first got interested in bacteria, I thought, well, they're single-celled organisms. How complicated can they be? That seems like something I can wrap my brain around. Well, <laughs> little did I know exactly how complicated they can be. And in fact, that's what I've come to really love about studying bacteria is the relative complexity of these little single-celled organisms. And so I want to thank you guys for showing up to my talk, despite the fact that the word complex or complicated is right in the title. So I can imagine where that might be intimidating. But let's lead you into it slowly. So particularly, I've always been interested in how bacteria interact with other organisms. So I want to define some terms for you from the beginning, because I know not all of you are necessarily familiar with studying bacteria. And so symbiosis is defined as uh, when two organisms live together long term. And the types of symbiosis uh, that can occur sort of depend on the effect that the relationship has on the partners. And so there's two major types of symbiosis that I'll talk about with respect to bacteria. Uh, the first is mutualism. So this is a situation in which both partners engaged in the interaction benefit from that interaction. And so this is the uh, example that I wanted to use today. And this is, of course, what Greg said that I, I, talked, or I worked on during my PhD research. Sorry, what Dr. Richards said. I worked on during my PhD research. And so I worked on a, a bacterium called Vibrio fischeri. And this is a, um, an auger plate in which I've grown tons of bacterial colonies. So each of these dots is probably thousands to millions of bacterial cells that are able to glow in the dark. Uh, and so that's sort of an odd thing for a bacteria to be able to do. And so why does it do it? And it turns out it does it because of its relationship with its host, which is a, a Hawaiian squid called Euprimna scolopes. Uh, this cute little guy here. And so the bacteria actually live within a specialized organ of the squid called the light organ. Um, and so this is, a, this is a mutualistic interaction. And so the, in the light organ, the squid is providing nutrients to the bacteria. So the bacteria can grow and survive better than it can just in the ocean water by living by itself. <laughs> And then the bacteria, in turn, are providing light for the squid. So why does the squid need light? So it turns out that the squid likes to um, hunt for its food in the evening. But it's a shallow water squid. And so the moonlight shines down on the, on the uh, water. And what would normally happen is that the squid, as it's foraging for food, would cast a shadow. And then whatever is going to prey on the squid can track the squid's shadow along the ocean floor. But what the bacteria do is they provide light. The squid actually can direct this light below itself, and it prevents the squid from casting a shadow on the ocean floor. And so this is an anti-predation mechanism where the bacteria are providing light for the squid so that their, uh, whatever wants to eat the squid can't find the squid. So it's a pretty unique, fun system. And so again, the mutualism comes because the squid is providing nutrition to the bacteria, and the bacteria are pro uh, providing light to the squid. OK, so then the other type of symbiosis uh, that I'll cover today besides mutualism is parasitism. So this is when one partner benefits and the other is harmed. Um, and so parasitism, when we're talking about bacteria, sometimes we also call this pathogenesis. And so we kind of use those terms a little bit interchangeably. And so one of the examples I have here is a skin infection on a human uh, known as a staph infection. And it's called a staph infection because the, eight, the bacteria that causes it is called Staphylococcus aureus. And so this is a microscopic image of individual Staphylococcus cells. And so here again, uh, the host, in this case the human, is providing resources for the bacteria, including nutrients. But in this case, the host is actually harmed by the interaction because the bacteria is producing toxins and things that can harm the host's cells, and they're inducing an immune response in the host, as indicated by this red ring here, um, which is also actually harmful to the host. So we have these two very different things. And again, I like to think about these things from the perspective of the bacteria. And so we have mutualism versus parasitism, which on the surface seem like very different things. The bacteria needs to do different things in each of these. In the case of mutualism, the bacteria needs to produce factors that are beneficial to the host in some way. So the example we used was luminescence. Uh, and in the case of virulence, the bacteria has to be able to, in some cases, they have to escape the host immune response. Uh, they also have to produce things like what we call virulence factors. So anything that's going to cause disease or, or harm in the host is known as a virulence factor. So the bacteria is doing two very different things in these two interactions. But at the same time, mutualism and, and parasitism, from the perspective of the bacteria, can be very similar. And so um, if we think about it, in both cases, the bacteria has to, in many, many um, cases, has to be able to recognize and be able to initiate an association with the host. So um, in the case of the, the 
uh, Vibrio squid mutualism, the bacteria has to be able to seek out uh, the host and, and enter into the host environment. Um, and that would be the case for a parasitism or pathogenesis as well. And then the bacteria has to be able to survive within the host environment, which may represent a very different environment uh, for the bacteria to get used to relative to where else it might live. So symbiosis, mutualism and parasitism don't always have to be so different. And so in studying the similarities and differences between symbiosis and parasitism, why not study an organism that does both? And so that's what I do. And so here's the system that I work on. And so first I'll talk about one of the interactions, which is a mutualism. So this is a, um, a tiny microscopic worm known as a nematode. And this particular species is called Steinernema carpocapsi. And this is the bacteria that I work with. And again, this is a microscopic image of individual bacterial cells, and this bacteria is known as Xenorhabdis nematophila. And these two engage in a mutualistic interaction that I'll cover in more detail in just a second. But there's also, together, uh, the nematode and the bacteria are actually parasites of a third host organism. And this is this cute little guy here, known as Manduca sexta, or the tobacco hornworm. Um, now, it turns out that this worm and its bacterial contents can actually infect uh, a range of different types of insects, including this one, mostly in the Lepidopteran order. So things that you would think of as caterpillars are usually infected by this nematode bacterial pair. And so, um, and again, the, the one we use in the lab is this guy, this Manduca sexta. And so it seems sort of unfortunate that arguably the most attractive member of this interaction is the one that is killed. <laughs> However, this guy's not quite so innocent. And so these guys, um, so the tobacco hornworm, as the name might imply to you, actually can destroy tobacco crops because that's their food of choice. Uh, their relatives destroy things like tomato crops, corn, things like that. And so these actually represent rel uh, very relevant agricultural pests. And so the parasitism by the, uh, the nematode and the bacteria is actually very, a very relevant area of studying for controlling the populations of these agricultural pests. So now let's go into more detail about how each of these interactions work. OK, so we'll talk about the mutualism first. So here's our nematode again. And this is, again, a microscopic image of a Steinernema carpocapsi nematode. Um, it is a, this is the, a particular developmental stage of the nematode that is uh, colonized by the bacteria, known as the infective juvenile, or IJ stage. And in the IJ, uh, it has a specialized region, so here's the head of the IJ and here's the, er, of the nematode and here's the tail. And within that, there's a specialized region that is continuous with the intestine of the nematode, known as the receptacle. So here's an empty receptacle over here. You can't, it's a little hard to, uh, to distinguish the intestine, but it does run this way. And so this is basically like a pouch in the intestine that's formed in the IJ. And these bacterial cells colonize this region. And so... Um, which you can't see because the little uh, error message is in the way, is that um, the receptacle, so we talked about mutualism, and all the examples I gave you in symbiosis is that the host is providing nutrients to the bacteria. But in this case, the receptacle, actually we've done a lot of studies to find out that the receptacle of the nematode is actually not a very good environment for the bacteria in terms of nutrient uh, provision. And so the bacteria don't grow very happily in the receptacle, they don't find a lot of the nutrients that they need. So why then does this mutualism take place? So what is the nematode doing for the bacteria? And we'll get to the role of the bacteria in a minute. So what the nematode does, as it turns out, is it provides transportation to the bacteria to the other host, which is the insect. So here's the symbiotic life cycle of the nematode, the bacteria, and the insect. So everything that's happening above this line here is in the soil before infection takes place. And then the infection takes place, and this is all going to happen within the insect. So to take you through it, uh, the nematode and its bacterial partners crawl through the soil. Again, the bacteria are inside the nematode. Nematodes crawls, crawls through the soil until it finds an insect or a caterpillar to infect. Okay, so it infects the insect, and then once inside, the nematodes release their bacterial contents. So now the nematode are going to develop separately from the bacteria. So the nematodes release the bacteria into the insect, and um, both of them go through their various reproductive cycles. And then the nematodes, so eventually, um, what's going to happen is that the nutrients that are present in the insect are going to run out. And so what happens then is somehow, and we don't exactly know how this happens, the partners recognize that there are no, no more nutrients for them to use to fuel their reproductive activities. And so then the bacteria actually recolonize the receptacle of the uh, infective juvenile nematodes, and then they crawl back out into the soil to seek out a new host. And so thinking from the bacterial perspective, what is the bacteria doing at each of these stages? Infection, reproduction, and transmission. 
So we actually know that the bacteria are primarily responsible, at least in this relationship, for killing the insect. Okay? And so it produces a number of virulence factors that will kill the insect. And in fact, if we inject the bacteria directly into the insects, so we provide the transportation for them, the, the, the bacteria will kill the insects on their own. So the nematode itself is, is not really the agent that is killing the insect. It's the bacteria that's doing that. And so, so next, the bacteria are also responsible for producing factors such as lipases and proteases that are going to break down host tissues such as lipids and proteins. And so what happens then is that those lipids and proteins that the bacteria is breaking down from the insect tissues are going to be used as a nutrient source not only for the bacteria but also for the nematodes. And so here's where the other half of the mutualism with the nematode takes place. So the nematode is giving the bacteria a free ride into the insect and in return the bacteria is, breaking, is not only killing the insect, but also breaking down the insect tissues and turning it into nutrients for both the bacterial and nematode partners in this interaction. And then somehow the bacteria need to be able to recognize when it's time to colonize the nematodes, and they need to be able to colonize the nematode receptacles uh, at this stage in the life cycle. And so we know a lot about the bacterial factors that are required for each of these stages, and so I'll, I'll go into more detail on those in a little bit. And so in thinking about, um, sorry, I'll go back for a second. In thinking about this, um, these different stages of what the bacteria needs to be doing, we think about how the bacteria knows when to, do, when to uh, form the right response. And so for example, the bacteria here in this stage, in the infection stage, are going from a very nutrient poor environment, which is the receptacle of the nematode, uh, to the insect. And so all of a sudden, once they enter into the insect, now the, the bacteria need to be producing virulence factors because they need to kill the insect. Uh, they're in a nutrient-rich environment, so now they can uh, produce all of the factors that are required to start breaking down the insect tissues. And so this is a very different environmental change for the bacteria to be able to adapt to. And that's what I'm interested in, is studying how the bacteria adapts to transitioning from the nematode environment to the insect environment and throughout this life cycle. And so how do bacteria in general adapt to environmental changes. And so there are a couple of different ways bacteria typically use to adapt to environmental change. The first one I'll tell you about is sensing. So this is when uh, the bacteria are able to sense a change in environment and then respond. And so what we have here is our white cells here and our black cells here. So the black cells are ones that are producing virulence factors. And so what ha is happening here is that these cells are not producing virulence factors. Once they enter into a host in which they want to produce virulence factors, they sense something about the environment of the host that tells the bacterial population, hey, we're inside the host now, let's start making virulence factors so that we can kill the host. And so the entire population adapts to that change that they sense and start producing virulence factors. So this is a situation where we get adaptive expression of virulence factors, where we go from the entire population not expressing virulence factors to the entire population now turning on virulence factor expression. But there's another way bacteria can adapt to changes in their environment, and this one's a little more complicated. So this is called clonal variation. So this is when cells within a single population, so these cells all have the same DNA, they are genetically identical, but they are exhibiting different characteristics within a single population. And so here we have a situation in which we have a single population of bacterial cells, but some of them are producing virulence factors and some of them are not. So at any given time, whether the bacteria are in the inset or in the host, sorry, or outside of the host, there's a subpopulation of cells that are producing virulence factors. And this makes the entire population prepared for entry into a host at any given time. So instead of adapting once they're inside the host, there are always a few, at least a few cells that are expressing virulence factors. And in this type of um, scenario in clonal variation, cells for the most part, can switch back and forth between these two characteristics. These are also known as phenotypes, the characteristics. So I'll use those words interchangeably. Okay, so this is variable expression of virulence factors within a single population, rather than the entire population adapting from one state to another. So as it turns out, this is what Xenorhabdis nematophila uses, is one of these clonal variation pathways. And so uh, throughout the talk, I'll represent my virulent Xenorhabdis nematophila cells as black ovals and the attenuated or less virulent uh, Xenorhabdis nematophila cells as white uh, ovals. And theoretically, they can switch back and forth between these two characteristics. And we call this the virulence modulation or VMO switch. So how do we know this is happening? 
So first I want to tell you a little bit about how we do our experiments in the lab and show you how we discovered uh, this phenomenon in the first place. And so when you grow bacteria in the lab, you start with uh, a low number of cells that you spread over a nutrient plate. So this is an auger plate. And so, and these are individual cells that are spread across this plate. And then this plate contains nutrients for the bacteria, so they grow into colonies. So each colony arises from a single uh, original cell. And then you can grow them further in culture. So what I want to point out here is that when I'm depicting these as black versus white colonies or less virulent versus virulent colonies, we can't tell just by looking at the bacteria on a plate which ones are virulent and which ones are not virulent. We have to actually do an experiment to determine which are which, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to depict them in these two different ways, even though we can't necessarily tell in the lab just yet. So then we grow the cells, uh, the colonies in culture. So when we pick these colonies, again, we're growing them in liquid culture now, and they're going to they're gonna keep dividing. And what I want to point out at this point, just to keep in the back of your mind, is that this type of um, switching is usually inherited. So if you start with a cell that is virulent, it's going to give rise to mostly daughter cells that are also virulent. So we can grow colonies and larger populations of cells that are mostly virulent in terms of their phenotype or characteristic. However, what can happen is there can be switching back and forth. So you can end up with a mostly attenuated or mostly virulent population that has one or two or a small population of the other characteristic in it as well. So just something to keep in mind. OK, so then what we can do is we can take, so we've started two cultures here, one with one colony, one with another type of colony. And we inject each of these cultures into a large number of insects. And so again, if they're, if they're virulent, they're going to kill the insects. If they are not virulent, they are not going to kill the insects, or they're going to be at least worse at killing the insects. And so then we can monitor the survival of the insects over time to determine which of these starting populations were virulent and which of them were not. So here's what that kind of data looks like. So here I've, I've picked six different colonies off of a plate to start cultures and use for injections. And these are all what I'm calling WT, and WT stands for wild type. And this means it's a normal strain of the bacteria, Xenorhabdis, and there are no mutations in this strain, and they're all the same strain. Just six different colonies from a plate. And so what we can see here is that the first three, although it's a little bit difficult to see because all the icons are right on top of each other, these first three killed all of the insects into which they were injected within 20 hours. So we're looking at percent survival of the insects over time. At the start of the experiment, 100% of all of the insects were alive, and now these three it goes to 0% survival, so none of the insects were alive within the 20 hours, uh, the first time point. Whereas these last three here, the insects survived much longer. They were mostly eventually killed, but in this case, this one only killed uh, about 60% of the insects by the end of the experiment. So we have one population that was very virulent and one population that was attenuated or less virulent from the same original strain. Okay. So what are we imagining is going on here? So that was part of my goal. So my goal when I entered into this, so this is the project that I sort of inherited when I came into the lab. And my boss said to me, well, we need to figure out what's going on. What are the factors that are involved in switching? So as you might imagine, we know that the one population is virulent, the other population is not. So maybe one population is expressing virulence factors and the other population isn't. That's the simplest hypothesis. And so that's what I started with. But studying virulence factors in Xenorhabdis is really not easy. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about what we, uh, the different bacterial factors that we know are required for each of these stages in the symbiotic life cycle, infection, reproduction, and transmission. And then we'll get back to how that helps me study uh, virulence modulation. So we know that Xenorhabdis produces a number of different virulence factors. And that's part of the reason it's so hard to study. It produces things like hemolysins, which are basically proteins that are going to help break down the insect blood cells, or hemocytes. Uh, it produces a number of different toxins. Uh, and it also is able to somehow, and we don't know how it does this yet, but it is able to suppress the insect immune response. And so, uh, and again, we don't know the, fa the ba exact bacterial factors that are involved, but we know it is able to do so. So that's most of what's going on in infection. Uh, the bacteria is also producing lipases and proteases, which are proteins to break down lipids and proteins in the insect. And so those are, we believe, to be involved in infection as well. But they're also certainly involved in the reproductive stage. And the reproductive stage is when the bacteria and the nematodes are 
reproducing, and they are using the products of these lipases and proteases to fuel that uh, reproductive cycle. So those are probably involved in both infection and reproduction. And then the bacteria also produces antibiotics. And we think that the reason for this is because the bacteria is breaking down these host tissues, so the host, immune, so the host is dead. It is no longer able to form an immune response. And so there's nothing to prevent other bacteria from the environment around the insect from coming in and stealing the meal that Xenorhabdis and the nematode have worked so hard to obtain. And so the bacteria actually produces antibiotics to prevent other bacteria from coming in and stealing their food source. And finally, uh, we know that the bacteria produces a number of different factors that are involved in colonization of the nematodes. We know a little bit about what those are, but I'm not going to go into detail about that portion of the life cycle today. So just from looking at this diagram, you can see how it's a little bit complicated to study virulence in Xenorhabdis because it uses a lot of different factors during the infection stage. And in fact, if you get rid of any one of these, the bacteria is still pretty virulent. And so in studying, in thinking about a system where we have cells that are virulent and cells that are not virulent, it would probably be best if the bacteria could turn on and turn off expression of all of these using one simple mechanism. And so that's where I come in, so I study this protein called LRP. LRP is a regulatory protein, so it can turn on or turn off expression of other genes within the cell. And in fact, we know that LRP regulates expression of very many, in fact, about 10% of all of the genes within the Xenorhabdis nematophila genome. And it can either, like I said, turn up or turn down or on or off expression of some of these. And so we know a lot about what LRP does in the cells. And so it turns out that we know that LRP turns on or turns up expression of all of these different factors involved in infection and reproduction, whereas LRP turns down expression of genes that are involved in nematode colonization. And so here is one protein that can, can control the expression of all of the factors that we predict to be involved in virulence. And so we also know that if we get rid of LRP in the cells, the cells are no longer very virulent. So they have an attenuated or less virulent phenotype. So they don't kill insects quite as well as cells that do have LRP. So we know that it's involved in virulence. And so the easiest hypothesis to make here is that perhaps the amount that you can't read here, but the amount of LRP that's present in a given cell dictates whether it is virulent or whether it is not virulent or attenuated. Okay, so we didn't know whether LRP expression varied from cell to cell in this manner in Xenorhabdis. And so that was the first thing that I wanted to ask is whether LRP expression varies uh, in a way that correlates with this VMO switch. So I need to take a step back here and talk about how we study gene regulation or expression in bacteria. And so here is a region of the genome that is DNA. And this is the region that has the gene that encodes LRP, which is the protein I'm interested in studying. So uh, just to bring you through the central dogma of genetics, just in case you don't have uh, a lot of background with that. So in all organisms, DNA is first transcribed into RNA. So here's our gene that is transcribed into RNA message. And then the RNA message is translated into the final protein. And organisms can control each of these stages of gene expression. And so um, organisms can turn up or turn down transcriptions. So you get no RNA or low levels of RNA versus higher levels of RNA. And the same thing can happen to control the process of translation. Now, for the most part in bacteria, Regulation occurs at the level of transcription. So transcription is very often turned up or turned down in bacterial cells to control gene expression. And so that's what I decided to study. So I refined my question here a little bit. So I'm looking at does LRP transcription vary with the VMO switch? And so how do we study that? So here's our LRP gene again. And so what I didn't tell you before is this little arrow here represents a promoter. And what the promoter is, is it sits in front of a gene, and this is where the transcriptional machinery that's actually going to uh, transcribe the DNA into RNA, that's where it will bind. And so that the area around the promoter is also DNA. It's not part of the gene, but it's this called the regulatory region because things like transcription factors can bind here. And the transcription factors can either turn up or turn down expression from this promoter to control expression of the gene. So how do we study that in the lab? Because I want to ask how LRP is controlled in terms of its transcription in the cells. So what we can do is we can make a copy 
of this regulatory region, including the promoter, and we can place it in front of a different gene. And so the gene I'm using here is LAXZ. LAXZ is called a reporter gene. So a reporter gene is anything that encodes a protein that has an activity that can be easily observed. And so in the case of LAXZ, if a cell is expressing the LAXZ protein, which is known as beta-galactosidase, uh, the back, if you give it a certain chemical, there will be a color change, so it'll turn blue. So we can easily determine how much LAXZ is being expressed in any given cell. And so what we're doing here is we're using the LRP promoter and regulatory region to control expression of our reporter, LAXZ. And so in this way, we can look at how much LAXZ is being produced, and that can give us an indirect readout of how much LRP is being produced. So if there's lots of LAXZ in a cell or LAXZ protein in a cell, that means there's lots of activity happening from this promoter, and therefore there's probably also lots of LRP in that cell as well, and vice versa. So this is how we study transcription, and so what we actually do in the lab is we take our cells that contain this, what we call reporter construct with the LRP promoter controlling LAXZ expression, so that's the little blue stars here, they're a little hard to see, and again, we start cultures with these from colonies, and we inject them into insects because, as I said, we can't tell just by looking at the cells on a plate which ones are virulent and which ones are not, so we want to know that information, so we do another virulence assay. But we also take part of the same culture that we use to inject into insects, and we can measure the beta-galactosidase activity, or LAXZ expression, that happens in each of these cultures. So we can correlate how much LAXZ expression we have in a certain culture, which tells us how much LRP expression we have in a culture, and we can see if that somehow correlates with the ability of the cells to kill the host. All right, so here's our workflow over here, which I just told you about. So in this case, I'm taking four colonies off of a plate, starting four cultures, and then using those for both the reporter assay and the insect injections. So this is just one representative experiment of tons and tons of times I've tried this. So here's our virulence assay. Again, we're looking at percent survival of the insects over time. And what you can see here, and like in my other examples, there were two colonies, and these are the red and green, which is the colors are a little hard to see, I apologize for that, but they are um, one and three. And these are not very good at killing the insects, and so this is the attenuated population. And here's two other colonies that are pink and blue, colonies two and four, that are very good at killing the insects. So we have a virulent population and an attenuated population. And then I wanted to see how much LRP is being expressed from these two different populations, and is the number different. So here's our reporter assay. It's um, showing you here in terms of Miller units. So Miller units are just sort of an arbitrary number uh, that give us uh, an idea for the total amount of reporter expression. And we're going to look at the reporter expression levels in each of our four colonies. And so what we see here is that, in fact, LRP expression, or transcription at least, is very high in colonies one and three, which behaved similar to one, one another in the infection assay, so these were the attenuated cells, and colonies two and four were the, have low levels of LRP expression and they were very virulent. So this is great. It looks like the amount of LRP expression is different in this population compared to this population, which is what I wanted. But the pattern is very different. And so if you remember, I told you that if there's LRP around, it's probably turning on expression of virulence factors. But what I'm seeing here is that the most virulent populations are actually expressing the least amount of LRP. So this is really counterintuitive. So let me go back to this uh, Venn diagram. And so again, I told you that LRP is known to turn up expression of all of these virulence factors. And yet what the data are telling me is that high levels of LRP result in decreased virulence. So why would that be? So the first thing I wanted to do is go back in and see whether or not high levels of LRP are giving me high levels of virulence factor production and low levels of LRP would give me low levels of virulence factor production because we hadn't directly tested that just yet. And so before I do that, I want to focus on one potential complication which I introduced earlier to doing these types of experiments in the lab is that, again, just by looking at the cells, we can't tell which ones are virulent and which ones are attenuated. I don't really love killing tons and tons of caterpillars, so it would be nice if I could isolate strains that have one or the other characteristic and can never switch back and forth. And so that's the first thing I did, is I generated fixed strains. Now that I know what's different between those two strains in terms of LRP expression, so I generated two different strains. One strain that is, every single cell is virulent and they never switch back and forth. 
and the other strain, every single cell is attenuated and they don't switch back to the virulent characteristic. And I did this by controlling the amount of LRP that's expressed in each of these populations. So the virulent population is making low levels of LRP and the attenuated population is making high levels of LRP. And I did this by switching out the promoter and regulatory region that controls LRP expression in each of these strains. Okay, so now I can go back in and ask the question that I wanted to ask, which is, is the high LRP population expressing higher levels of virulence factors than the low LRP population? So I'm just gonna show you one example of the experiments I did to show that that was the case. So uh, we can pretty easily look at a, a lot of these activities in the lab. And so one of the assays that we do is looking for the expression of hemolysin, which is the protein that breaks down blood cells in the insect. And so we can use a hemolysin assay to look at the relative amounts of hemolysin that is being produced by each of my two populations. And so we do this by using an auger plate that contains blood cells. And so it has both blood cells and it has bacterial nutrients. So the bacteria can grow. And if they uh, are producing hemolysins, they are going to break down the blood cells in the immediate area in which they are growing. And this causes the plates to go from a very solid red color to sort of it, not exactly white, but sort of a clear white color around it. So as those cells are being broken down, uh, you get a clearing around the cell, around the colony of bacteria. And so the idea here is, the, again, that I hypothesized that my attenuated or less virulent population that is making more LRP is also gonna make more hemolysins, and the opposite would be true for the other population, which is the low LRP population. Okay, so I would see a smaller area of clearing or um, less hemolysin activity from this population than this one. Okay, so, and that's in fact what I saw. So here's a picture of the plate. Hopefully this is a little bit easier to see. Um, so here we have our high LRP population, which is also the attenuated phenotype or characteristic population. And here we see a large ring of clearing around the bacterial colony. Whereas with the low LRP population, I'm getting less hemolysin produced and I'm not seeing really any zone of clearing. And so this doesn't mean that the bacteria is not producing any hemolysin, it's just not making enough that this ring is expanding outside the area in which the cells are growing. So it's making some hemolysins, but not as many as this population here. Okay, so it seems like the population that is less virulent is actually making more virulence factors than the other population. So how can we possibly explain why too much LRP and therefore too many virulence factors would be a bad thing in virulence? And so just in thinking about it, I can't give you an exact answer. We haven't done the experiments just yet, but what I can tell you is if you imagine it, um, sort of like a home invasion scenario. So if a burglar comes in and it's, it sneaks through the, they sneak through the security system, they don't make a lot of noise, you're not gonna know that they're there, they're gonna get what they want and be able to get out. If a burglar comes in and just breaks through the window, sets off the alarm, doesn't care, makes a big ruckus of things, that's not really a good situation, they're gonna get caught. So we think of our bacteria as our burglar infecting the insect, which is the home, right? So if the bacteria comes in guns blazing, making tons and tons of virulence factors, Maybe it's making so many virulence factors that it's setting off all of the alarms or the immune system in the insect, and the insect is able to respond more rapidly than what the bacteria is able to fight against or keep up with, and so all the bacteria are dead. So that might be an explanation why cells that are making lots of virulence factors would be less good at killing the insects relative to ones that come in a little bit more quietly and make just enough virulence factors to, in fact, sneak in and kill the insect. So that's my current hypothesis there. So where is this project going to go in the future? What comes next? What kinds of questions can we ask? Well, one of the things I want to ask is, so we know we have two different populations that are showing up in Xenorhabdis. One of the populations is virulent. So it's certainly specialized for the infection process. But what is the purpose for having this other population that's making lots of virulence factors um, that's not good for virulence? So, what is this other attenuated population specialized for? Maybe it's a different stage of the symbiotic life cycle. So is it reproduction or transmission? So one of the things I'm looking at now is taking my two fixed populations that are either attenuated or virulent and putting them through very standard assays that we use in the lab to assess their ability to support nematode reproduction and to support nematode or to colonize the nematode. So we can ask those kinds of questions. Um, another thing that I want to do is look at how LRP expression changes in the different host environments. And so 
Um, what I told you in the beginning is that with clonal variation, or VMO, you can get one population that has many characteristics. And so what I represented is a 50-50 population, half the cells are producing virulence and half of them, virulence factors and half of them aren't. But that's really not likely to be the case in the wild, in the actual situation. And so what we do know about clonal variation is that the switch back and forth can be biased in one direction or another, depending on the bacteria's environment. So if the bacteria is inside uh, the host, it can turn on the virulent characteristic more often than the attenuated characteristic and vice versa. So I want to look at, so that'll also help me determine which, uh, what the specialization of each of these populations is if I can go back in and I can look at LRP expression, is it high or is it low uh, in most of the cells in any given scenario. So in the host, in the insect versus in the, in the nematode. And so the way that we do this is the same type of reporter assay that I showed you with the LAC-Z expression. But instead here, we use the LRP transcriptional regulatory region to control expression of a fluorescent protein called GFP, or green fluorescent protein. And so what I can do then is I can look at LRP expression in each individual cell within a population inside the different hosts. And so in the, in the nematode, here's bacteria, individual bacteria that are inside the receptacle of the nematode. So we can actually, it's hard to see here, but you can actually see single cells and you can ask, which cells have high LRP expression, which cells have low LRP expression, and what population dominates in this environment. So this isn't that assay yet. This is just cells that are all expressing the same amount of GFP. But that's how we're going to ask that question in the future. It's a little more difficult to do this with insects because with nematodes, you can put them on a microscope and you can see the bacteria without really having to do anything. With the insects, however, so I want, if I want to ask how much LRP is being expressed in the insect environment, it gets a little trickier because you can't just put the insects on a microscope and look at the bacteria. And so instead we have to infect the insects and then over various times after we do the infection, we can get the bacterial cells back out and then just look at the cells under the microscope immediately after we take them out of the insect and look at, again, the populations. Are there more high expressing, high LRP expressing cells or a more low LRP expressing cells? And we can look at which characteristic dominates in this environment. Okay, so to bring it back into perspective, why do we care about studying clonal variation in Xenorhabdis nematophila? Again, I mentioned that this is a very important um, agricultural pest, the insects that are being killed here. And so the more we know about how this parasitism works, how the bacteria and nematodes optimize killing of the insect, the more we might be able to optimize the use of these agents in things like pest control. So we can, a lot of farmers actually will order nematodes with their bacterial counterparts to plant or spread throughout their garden to prevent these pests from coming along and destroying their gardens. To optimize this for sort of uh, the agricultural industry, is a little trickier. And so the more we know about how this parasitism takes place, the more we can optimize the efficiency of that type of um, pest control management scenario. And then finally, why do we care about clonal variation in general? Well, clonal variation is actually very common among many different pathogens, including human parasites. So one of the most famous examples is the Europathogenic E. coli or UPEC species. And so UPEC species can um, cause infections in the uropathogenic, in the, uh, the uh, what is the word I'm looking for, in the urethra, the bladder, and the kidneys. And what it takes for the bacteria to cause an infection in the bladder versus the kidneys are different things. So the bacteria is expressing different virulence factors in the uh, bladder versus the kidneys, for example. And so it's known that uropathog uropathogenic E. coli use a clonal variation system so at any given time, if they're in the kidneys, there is a population of cells expressing the kidney-specific virulence factors, but there is also a population of cells expressing the bladder-specific virulence factors and vice versa, so that they can cause an infection in whatever environment they happen to end up in. And so this is a great system to study, and it tells us a lot, but with human pathogens, they're difficult to study in the lab. You can't just infect humans and see what happens, so you have to have a model system. And with UPEC, they use these poor little mice. And really, this doesn't always represent a natural host for these bacterial cells. So you're, you're forcing these bacteria to infect a host that they wouldn't normally infect in order to study what's going on in humans. And so there can be a lot of complications with that. Um, and so sometimes it's better if you can take an interaction that does happen in nature. So this is a natural interaction that we study, Xenorhabdis bacteria in the wild, 
do populate the nematode gut and the nematodes and their bacterial counterparts do infect these insects in the natural environment. So this is a natural system. Okay, so with that I want to thank my lab mates who have been instrumental in the process of me figuring out all of these different questions, including of course Dr. Richards here, um, and all of my advisors in this process. And so a little, little plug in for UW-Madison, it's a very uh, nice place. If any of you want to pursue some graduate study there, I would highly recommend it. It's, it's a great place to be. So thank you.